every great show needs both good news and bad news to be interesting and entertaining. But wait, Jim Derry, it's Good Friday. Shouldn't we have all good news? Hmm. Is that possible when spending more than half the show talking about the New Orleans Saints and their issues along the offensive line? You have solutions. I'm all ears. Well, we do have the New Orleans Pelicans and the LSU women's basketball team. And we have Fletcher Mack from WDSU-TV. And it's all coming up next on the Datitude Podcast. If you're looking for the latest scoop and in-depth interviews on the Saints, the NFL, the Pelicans, LSU, along with the best bets of the week, then lucky you. Along with high-powered, in-the-know guests who cover our teams, Jim Derry brings plenty of datitude. And he'll always tell you the way it is, or at least the way he thinks it is. Where you at, New Orleans? And hello to my friends elsewhere, everywhere, out there who are trying to come down from sports sensory overload on Thursday. What a crazy day of sports yesterday. No doubt about it. Unless you're a football only kind of a guy or gal, it was insane. You had the Pelicans, you had Major League Baseball uh, opening day. You had some crazy Sweet 16 basketball games, or at least two of them. And yep, more brackets go. Yeah, you know that sound. That's that's what all those those brackets are just going boom all over the place. Uh, let's get into it. This is Datitude episode number 221 for a good Friday, March the 29th, 2023, our final show in the month of March. I am your host, Jim Derry. Gabe Henderson is in the background making sure I don't say anything stupid. Good luck with that. Uh, and whether you're watching on one of our NOLA.com social media channels or listen to the podcast, as always, I thank you for being a part of the Datitude family. Uh, reminder, if you're watching live uh, on our one of our NOLA.com social media channels or listen to the podcast, as always, uh, you can click. Uh, we want you to click like on, on the YouTube page. We want you to subscribe to the YouTube page, Datitude, at Datitude Pod. And you can comment in the comment stream. Uh, Fletcher Mackle coming up in just a moment. If you have comments for Fletcher or a question, uh, you just want to say hi or whatever it is, you can comment in the comment stream and we will put it on the screen. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, it's what we do every every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday right now, right? All right. Uh, well, like we said, Fletcher Mackle of DF, WDSU TV Sports uh, coming up in just a moment. Uh, we used to say Channel 6. You can't really say that anymore because people under the age of 30 – don't even really understand the concept of channel numbers. They just click on whatever their remote, whatever it says on the TV screen, they just click on. My 25-year-old son uh, couldn't find the Pelicans the other night because uh, it wasn't in its normal place on Bally Sports app. He's like, I told him it's on channel. He didn't understand what that means. It, it, it took him about 15 minutes to find it. God, I'm getting old. I'm getting older every day. You know who's not getting older? You know who who just d looks like he just never ages? It's Fletcher Mackle. You just you just don't age. What's going on, man? What's going on, dude? Does this work for you? This is my I normally do this on my phone, but my my COVID ring light has 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 hit a snag. I okay. Get, so I hope. The, do I sound okay? Do I you look sound okay? fine? You're okay, fine. Guys. If it's a little echoey, I apologize. So the COVID set up my office. I had it like ring light phone i had the earbuds the whole deal like the phone thing broke so i can't get the phone in there and i couldn't balance it so i'm like the hell with it i'm just i'm i'm, I'm doing my computer here and well, the, uh, I hope the this good works. the good news is the ring light won't be bouncing off your glasses you know so that it yeah. looks like you know you i had to stop wearing my ring glasses so sometimes i can't see so when I write, you know, I do write a script for part of the show. And it's like, I'm like, sometimes I look like I'm squinting because it's just because I don't want to wear my reading glass anymore because the ring light's shining off my face. But I'm telling you, you don't age, man. What, what's going, what do you, what do you, what do you do? You got to tell me what you, you and Travers both. I mean, what do y'all do? Yeah. Uh, genetically, uh, you know, blessed. I, uh, I, I don't do a lot. Like I do worry about what's on the inside sometimes, not the outside because like I ate at, I live in on the Bayou St. John, so I went down to Tubes Meadery last night, and I may have had like cracklings and in in like pig ears. So um, 
you know, while the outside looks okay, sometimes I do worry about got to take better care of the inside. Um, but uh, yeah, no, you know, here's the funny thing. I, I, I emceed the Manning Awards last night and it was great. Jaden Daniels won it. Cooper Manning, hilarious, like awesome. Um, so Cooper's like, my brother and I are right between Cooper and Peyton. Like Cooper's a little older, Peyton's a little younger. And so, and so I knew them growing up. My, my late father was good friends with Archie. I've known the Mannings forever. Um, and I joke with Cooper because people are like, do you all know each other? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, but when we were like, when Cooper was 16, he looked 21. And when I was 15, I looked 12. So like we didn't hang out in the same circles because he was like a younger dude hanging out with older dudes. I was like my age, but looked significantly younger. So like, you know, um, so, but that, I think that has benefited my brother and I in the fact that when we were 15, we were looked, we looked 12. When we were 18, we looked 15. When we were 21, we looked 17. But now that I'm in my forties, I guess it's okay that, we are like aging a little slower on the outside. Well, I can tell you how old I am. You bring up the Mannings. One of my first assignments was covering Newman basketball and Cooper, Randy Livingston and Peyton were all on the same basketball team. Peyton was a sophomore at Newman. So that's yep. how old I am. And that's how long I've been doing this. So they, yeah. let, me, they let me keep yeah, coming I was back. in high school during those years. So like I said, you know, Cooper graduated 92, Peyton graduated 94. Like, I remember that fall of 91 when Peyton was a sophomore, took over as a starting quarterback. Cooper was a senior wide receiver. Uh, and then, obviously, the basketball team w was really good that year and won a state championship with Randy. Um, so, yeah, no, that's that's going way back. De La Salle didn't play Newman back then, did they? No, you know why? It, I, I'll, I'll say this. I covered this year uh, – the, the woman that I work with, Kendall Duncan, she mostly covers, we do a game of the week on Friday night. Right. And she mostly does that. Um, but she was in, I think it may have been Tuscaloosa. It may have been the weekend LSU was playing Alabama. So she went to that game. And Del Sal played Newman in football. And it was awesome. Like, awesome. Like, the band from Del Sal marched down. I mean, the three blocks away. Like, marched over. The stands were packed. The game was electric like electric. But when I was in, in high school and you were obviously a few years older than me, I mean, the Catholic league was a big foray and eventually was. five a in Newman was like a smaller two A school. So like they didn't play even in like jamborees and stuff. Like they didn't play each other. Like the, the, the up down didn't happen. Like it does now. Like you see, I, like, you know, now I see teams and I'm like, man, oh man, like some of these big schools are playing small schools like Newman's going to Hornville to play. And, you know, but that just didn't happen back, you know, when, when I was in high school. So we we never, ever played Newman in anything like ever. No, but it didn't. But the good thing was, at least back when I was in high school, Shaw did play De La Salle in the Catholic League games. And even when we were bad, at least we knew we could win that game. Uh, you know, so there's that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Bell right. South I'll... football teams were not great when I was there. No, no, no. Uh, all right, all kidding aside, let's get to the – let's start with what we – I think is kind of the news of the week. And um, I want to start with Dennis Allen's press conference and what you thought of it. That was on Tuesday from the NFL owners meeting. And the Saints uh, are in an interesting time right now. They have a chance to be kind of what we thought maybe they would be the last two years and haven't been. But they also have a chance to regress. Uh, so they're kind of in no man's li right, land right now. You see, I think Atlanta's getting better. Uh, Tampa Bay proved that they can win without Tom Brady and still be decent. And we don't know if Baker Mayfield is going to continue how well he played last year. Mike Evans is going back. I think they're still going to be decent. Um, Carolina is what they are. But uh, what did you take out of the press conference from Tuesday and just kind of reading through the tea leaves and how you feel about where this team is going into the draft is just four weeks away now. So I'll start by saying this. I'll give Mickey Loomis, Dennis Allen, Jeff Ireland, because he's obviously the assistant general manager. We haven't seen the draft yet, but I'll give Mickey and Dennis credit. They, they remember that scene. I, I watch Moneyball from time to time. Yeah. And, and Brad Pitt tells Jonah Hill's character, he goes, why do you feel the need to explain to everybody what we're doing? Do you believe in this thing? And he's like, yes. And he's like, because we're going to see it through. You and me, it's just us. 
That's what I feel like Dennis and Mickey are right now. Like they are unwavering in their belief for one another in what they're doing. And I don't know if a lot of us on the outside see it. Like I, 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 I don't know if there's a path to 12 to 13 wins in an elite team in the NFC. I think they are back to being stuck in perpetual mediocrity that I think these, these people are too good. Like, I remember I went to a party and somebody's like, oh, they suck. And I'm like, that's the thing. They don't suck. Exactly. They are good. That they are good. They they are too good to be bad. Like they will never, Nikki, Jeff, Dennis, they will never bottom out. These people are too good at what they do to be bad. They are not going to be four and 13 or three and 14. I agree. But I don't know if they are elite enough to get to 11, 12, 13 wins. So like the large majority of the NFL, they fall into the middle class, and I think they are stuck there. Pre-Katrina, they were not bad. Like Joe Horn was good. Deuce McAllister was a pro bowler. There were defensive standouts. Aaron Brooks wasn't a bad quarterback. I agree. And they were 8-8, eight and 7-9, eight, and 9-7. Nine, nine and seven. Oh, they could maybe get there, and they fall short. That's what they are. They, they are built to the middle, and they are, that's where they're stuck. And so I, I understand Dennis and Mickey, they like the continuity. They, they like what they've built with who they built it with. But I don't know if that is going to grow into what we saw under Sean Payton and Drew Brees. Uh, my gut tells me that they're going to be in the thick of it in a weak division again. And right into it to the bitter end, and they're probably going to go eight and nine or nine and eight, and probably miss the playoffs again. You know, the great Mike Detillier was on this show uh, four weeks ago today, as a matter of fact, as we quote unquote rebranded uh, Datitude here. And you, one of the things he said, I think to take, he, you know, having Mike on, you can go on forever. But uh, the, the the most important thing he said, or I think what I took out of that show more than anything, was he said. There are basically in the NFL, there are eight teams you think every year that can win the Super Bowl. There are four teams that have absolutely no chance whatsoever. Uh, and then you have the 20 other teams that are in what he calls football purgatory. And the Saints are in football purgatory. And like you said, I think I don't know that there's any avenue, at least anytime soon, for them to get out. And I'm not, I'm trying not to to bash Dennis Allen too much, but I just don't get this gut feeling. Like it kind of goes along with what you said that the saints have the MO or the wherewithal. And part of it's because of the salary cap situation that they're in every year. I just don't feel like they have the chance to get out of football purgatory at least anytime soon. Not the wherewithal or the desire, because this is the one thing and, and again, it's not bad. Again, I just tell people this. I'm giving you my opinion and trying to shape it from having covered it for 20 years like you've covered things for a long time. So I think you look at professional sports and look at the NFL. You look at what's happening in Charlotte right now. Dave Tepper's their owner. He's kind of a crazy man. He's had four coaches in five years. He's flipped the roster. It, everybody's like, he's this hedge fund billionaire and he wants to win and he wants to go all in. He's done it. And they're awful and they're embarrassing and, and they fire coaches and they and they they people make fun of them. The Cleveland Browns were like that forever. Coaches, quarterbacks, we got to go all in, get your quarterback in the first round. I mean, how many quarterbacks did they drift in the first round that are awful? And so how many coaches did they turn over? So all these teams, when people are like, they got to go all in, you got to want to win, you got to make drastic moves. That Cool. The, the, the Eagles do that. The e Howie Roseman and the Eagles have had three coaches go to Super Bowls, three different quarterbacks take – like, I get it. it it's, they have been – the one anomaly that operates that way, knee-jerk, you got to be all in, and if you're not awesome, we may fire you. That's right. worked for them. But for a lot of other teams that have tried that, it doesn't work, and it hasn't worked. And so I do think there's something for the Saints to be said – about being consistently good and hoping you catch lightning in a bottle and break through the grape, you know? And so I, I'm not saying that's my opinion or my approach would be, but I'm just telling you that's their approach. That like 
the drastic knee jerk make changes, sure, that could be okay. We did that and we we got the right coach and the right quarterback. But that could also be Carolina of we fired a coach and we got rid of a quarterback. Oh, and we fired another coach. And now we got to draft right. a quarterback. Or the, or the Chicago Bears. Guess what? We're fired. We're getting rid of this quarterback and we're getting rid of that GM and we're getting rid of this quarterback. So teams that have done that, it, I mean, look, the Bears drafted Trubisky, traded way up to get him, then drafted Justin Fields to save him. It didn't save the coach. It didn't save the general manager. It didn't save their organization. And they're kind of an embarrassment. And I, so I, I think the Saints are very averse to doing embarrassing things. And that's, again, whether it's what I believe or not, there's nothing wrong with that. But also, you know, are you chasing greatness as well? So I, I just think, I, I look, I agree with what you said with what Dettelier said. They're stuck. I call it the middle class. They are not like a poverty franchise, but they are not like upper crust, upper echelon, like billionaires row in New York City. They are middle class and maybe maybe they can push themselves a little bit higher than that. But I don't look at them as like a championship contender. Jim Derry here with Fletcher Mackle this Friday morning, this good Friday morning, wherever you are. Thank you for watching. And uh, if you want to leave a comment in the comment stream, we'd be glad to show it like Michael does here, which is a great segue to where I want to go next. It says an inconsistent offensive line gets worse. I'd like to disagree with him, but I can't. You look at the offensive line right now, and if you look at the depth chart, there are actually only two fewer running backs on this depth chart right now than there are offensive linemen total. Not not just – I'm not just talking about tackle or guard or what. I'm talking about total. You look, Trevor Penning, Ole Udo, James Hurst, Mark Evans, Eric McCoy, Cesar Ruiz, Nick Saldaveri, Ryan Ramchek, Landon Young. And Ryan Ramchek is hurt. We don't know when he's coming back. Andrus Pete is an unrestricted free agent, so he's not on there. Look, Fletcher, I, I think that, you know, going into this draft, I've said this multiple times, people who listen to the show are probably getting tired of me saying it, but I think it's worth repeating. And my good friend Jeff Duncan, with all due respect, uh, was on Saints Insider the other day talking about how he thinks not only – are the Saints needing to go defensive line? He thinks that's where they're leaning. I don't see it. I don't understand it. I think if the Saints do anything but go offensive line in the first round of this draft and maybe more than that, I think we're talking about big-time problems. This team has got to draft a tackle, I think. I got a, uh, another comment from Taylor that I'll get to in just a minute, but I want to get your thoughts on that. Uh, offensive line, to me, is where this team just has to go. Yeah, uh, I'm also plugging my computer, as you can see, because I just realized that it was going to die if not. Um, we don't want that. So uh, I think I agree with you more than 100%, 110%. Like, there is, to me, if the Saints don't draft an offensive lineman at 14, I almost feel like it's franchise malpractice. Because, uh, again, if you look at it right now, if you look at it and say, okay, like, if we had, to, again, they still have the, the draft. They still have an offseason. But right now, Eric McCoy is a top 10 center in the NFL. Agreed. Cesar Ruiz is a starter in the NFL. He's a starter. I'm not saying yeah, he's, okay. he's That's a starter. Fair. Like, he's a starter. That's fair. So here's the thing. I just beat some free agent. Penning is trending bust. They wouldn't even play him at the end of last year. You know, Ryan Ramchick, I don't think is going to play. It certainly seems like he's trending towards not playing or or missing significant time. Uh, again, like, I know they drafted Nick Saldivari last year, but he never played. He was injured. So I look at the offensive line, and I get it. You could say wide receiver. You could still say pass rusher because Chase Young's coming off a neck injury now. Cam's coming off his worst year since his rookie year. Peyton Turner's trending bust. I, I get it. Like, you got they were, they were fifth worst in the NFL last year in producing sacks. So getting to the quarterback is important. So I understand what Jeff Duncan is saying, but who protects who protects the quarterback? Like uh, again, no like, one. That's what I mean. Like like street, you were playing street free agents at the end of last year, and you had a lot of offensive line issues, even when your unit was healthy early in the season. So I just look at it and I go, if they don't go O line, and this is a deep O line draft. I mean, th and quarterback especially are tackle. Go Right. And quarterbacks are going to go early. Like J.J. McCarthy's going in the top 10. 
Bo Nix may get taken in the top 12 before the Saints are on the clock. So, like, really good offensive tackles are going to drop to the Saints. And so, like, like, I could almost see the Saints going at 14 and 45, like, tackle guard or tackle, tackle. And, you know, uh, you know, Seattle did that a few years ago where they had two rookie tackles playing the year that Geno Smith became the comeback player of the year. Like, uh, and I'm not saying that that's a perfect solution is throw another rookie out there. People are going penny. But right now, I, I just don't know how. Drafting to a position of need is never good. You're always going to take past the table. Fletch, we're having a little trouble with your audio. It's kind of like uh, breaking up a little bit uh, right now. Uh, uh, while, while you're working on that, I do want to show a couple comments. Um, Gabe, in the background, uh, Gabe's with me. Gabe Henderson is there fact-checking things I say to make sure I don't sound dumb. He also says, that's why the Texans were so successful last year. Stroud had elite protection with Laramie Tunsil and company. There's no question about that. Also, uh, some other comments here. Don uh, Hoffman, a regular here. Thank you, Don, for, for being with us again. Put me in the camp that says, must have tackle with the first pick. Couldn't agree more. Taylor says Mickey Loomis hasn't done Dennis Allen any favors since he hired him as the head coach, terrible free agent signings and draft picks, keeping certain Sean Payton staff, certain people from Sean Payton staff. This is the first year we're actually seeing a Dennis Allen team uh, took year three to have his OC DC and quarterback. You know what, Taylor? I think that's a great comment. I actually agree with that. Um, so while I've been, again, while I've been on Dennis Allen Fletcher, I, I think this is his chance. If, Look, there was no question that they were going to give him another season. I mean, you could read the tea leaves. I I, I was really upset about the way the season ended in his apology uh, to to Arthur Smith and at the end of the season with the Falcons game. It really, really bothered me. But moving forward, if you're a Saints fan, look, you got to be happy. You got to go into it with some positivity. And so with that, with Taylor saying, I agree. This is the first year we're actually going to see a quote unquote Dennis Allen team. He gets his chance now. He either does it now or he doesn't. You got your new offensive coordinator in Clint Kubiak. You got to protect Derek Carr so we can see if he can become the top 10 quarterback that I actually think he can be if he gets protection. Yeah. Does my audio sound better Much now? better. Much better. Okay, sorry. If I, I moved to the part, portion of my house where the Wi-Fi isn't as good. Much um, better. Sorry about that. Sorry about the issues. I apologize. Oh, good. I'm just if I'm destroying the show here and making you throwing you curveballs in real time here, I destroyed it three years ago. Fletcher, we're still here. Um, so I agree with you though, Jim. Like, here's the thing: I think in New Orleans, look, we live under, we live below sea level. Like, you know, like we've supported the Saints, the fan base here for decades, decades of loserdom. Like, we are eternal optimists here, believing that, like. There's always a way. So I agree with you. This is Dennis Allen's team, finally. But they probably should have done this in year one. They probably should have said, hey, look, Sean's regime was Sean's regime. Let's just move off of that. It's just taken two years to do it. But there's no doubt. Last year, it was the defensive coaches. This year, it's the offensive coaches. This is now Dennis Allen's team through and through. Uh, and so you're right. We're going to see what he's made of, what his team looks like, what happens. And I, I, Carr's ability has never been questioned. You watch him at practice, I agree. and the dude spins the hell out of it. I mean, he's got a fantastic arm. He can make all the throws. He's athletic enough. Uh, it, but there's always been talented quarterbacks, and there's just – Drew Brees was never the most talented quarterback in the league, but his football IQ, his ability to operate an offense, it, you know – it doesn't always mean, boy, oh boy, he's the most talented. Does that mean he's the best? Uh, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't. So, But I do hope there is a breakthrough. And I hope that I'm wrong in the things that I told you before, that they are stuck in the middle class, or as Dettelier told you, purgatory. I, I hope they can break through. I hope it all comes together. I, I look at it like this. I gave somebody this analogy. They are like foot on the gas, slamming the accelerator down, speeding down like the desert, like in the movie, I think they're heading towards a cliff that they don't see. I think they see like the horizon in this football utopia that they're, they are going full steam. You know, they've doubled down on Cam. They've doubled down on DeMario. They've doubled down on Tyron Matthew. 
They've doubled down on Dennis Allen. They've doubled down on Derek Carr. They are, we are close. People don't see it. We see it's on the horizon, like the breakthrough. I unfortunately see maybe the cliff that they don't see coming that they're going to fall off of. But I I hope I'm wrong. And, and look, we're going to find out this year because, you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. I mean, you can't go 7, 10, 8, 9 and run it back again. You just can't. I'm going to say this. There is one thing for sure about this football team, and I'll, I'll give them this. They're the most uber positive people, and I, I believe this, inside their building. They, I, I think they see this utopia. I think they are uh, the – ultimate optimist i truly believe that i think they believe everything they say i don't think it's just lip service um but that being said i think the people who watch this team and cover this team on a regular basis ex- look jeff duncan is he's not gonna he just if he's saying something bad you know it's bad okay so he's not gonna tell it necessarily the way that it is he's gonna be uber nice as are a lot of people who cover this team I'm going to tell you the way that I think I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think the cliff is coming. Um, I think that they still can avoid the cliff. I think the, uh, the tires are about to fall off, but they have to be right. They, this draft to me is one of the most important drafts in this franchise is at least recent history. You can forget about the the seventies and eighties. I, we don't need to go back that far, but you want to talk about the Jim Moore era and you say, you know, we ain't good enough. Remember when Jim Morris said we ain't good enough and things change? Well, that's where this team is right now. And I think they need someone. You know Jim Moore as well as anybody. He's He comes on, he spends four months with you off and on. But this team ain't good enough. And the only way they're going to get good enough is if they toughen up along the front lines and toughen up inside. I think Dennis Allen needs to toughen up. I just don't see it. I hope I'm wrong. And I hope they can avoid that cliff that I think eventually is coming unless they change something in a big hurry. So, look, I I agree about the draft. And I think they've got to acquire more picks. They've got to. And and so, you go back, the the, the 2006 draft catapulted them into the success, the foundation that they built with, with, look, they signed Breeze as a free agent, massive, you know, foundation pillar. Fujita is a free agent. But that draft produced, franchise stabling stars like Marcus Colston, like Roman right. Harper, like Jari Evans, you know, even Zach Streif became a cornerstone guy. Reggie Bush was a, you know what I mean? They hit, even Ninkovich who went on to a career in New England, they hit in that draft in a big way. And then 2017, just think about this. They had six picks in the first three rounds in 2017. Lattimore, Ramchek, Marcus Williams, Alvin Kamara, Trey Hendrickson, Alex Anzalone. All massive hits, all pro bowlers knocked it out the park. But they had six picks in the first three rounds, like in the first 100. That is the mega value of the draft. So right now, what worries me is they're 14 and 45, and they don't pick again until like the fourth or fifth round. So like I'm one of these people who says, could you trade back a little bit? Like at 14, there's going to be so many offensive tackles. You can go from maybe 14 to 21 and get a second round draft pick and then say we at least have three picks in the top 50 or three in the top 60 and we got to hit on these dudes. We can't have Peyton Turner's, Marcus Davenport's, Trevor Pennings anymore. I mean, this was a stat that Jeff Asher, who did some work for us this year, pointed out. And he goes, if you want to know why the Saints are stuck in mediocrity and are bad, the Saints are the only team in the NFL since 2018 to not draft a pro bowl player. The only one, the only wow. one. That's insane. Since 2018, they have Rashid Shaheed made the pro bowl. He wasn't drafted by the new Orleans saints. Okay. Since 2018, not one draft pick has wow. made. How about this? The lions Five have had drafts. the most, the lions have had the most, the Ravens have had the second most, even the Texans, this year got C.J. Stroud into the Pro Bowl. But the, the worst team drafting in the last five years based on Pro Bowlers is the New Orleans Saints. So when you talk about the draft, yes, you got to start hitting on it. And this draft is, is critically important to kind of revamping 
this franchise. Hence why this team has become as stale as a loaf of moldy bread, because that's where they are right now. Seven and 10, nine and eight, and another mediocre season. I mean, look, let's be real. Would anyone be, I mean, I think everyone would be surprised actually if this team wins 11 games next year. I mean, I, I think I'd be floored honestly with unless they just hit it out the park in the draft and i agree with you zach ewing was on the other day um and we talked about this about potentially moving down and pro football focus has eight tackles in the top 29 picks uh, or at least in the top 29 uh best players available so if you're ever going to draft down there's no question we beating a dead horse no question tackle is the biggest need if you want to tackle Fletcher, I don't think there's any doubt that you could drop down to where you're talking about 21, 23, 24. And one of those tackles on the board is going to be there when you draft and to get an extra pick. And then you can get maybe a wide receiver in the second round with a de- pair with a defensive lineman or maybe even another offensive lineman to shore up depth. So I think if you were ever going to draft down, and I know it's not in the Saints MO, I don't even know if they know how to do it. But if you were ever going to do it, this certainly is the year to do that. Yeah, look, I agree 100%. And Mickey Loomis said at his season-ending media conference, things have gotten too comfortable, and it's my job to make things uncomfortable. Well, I think that includes him. And so I Mickey agree. Loomis has never, since he took over as GM, they have only traded up in the first round. He has never traded back. They went up to get Cedric Ellis. They went up to get Brandon Cooks. I mean, there's been multiple times that they have moved up the board to go get a guy they want and that or they just pick a guy they want and they don't move back i mean there were years when they were picking in the 20s when they could have done the the new england way they could have like instead of drafting peyton turner at like 27 or 28 they probably could have moved off of peyton turner and picked up more second and third round draft picks but they just don't do it they don't they do not trade back in the first round ever but maybe this is the year because i agree with you so on the value chart you remember in 2018 the Saints went from like 27 to 14 or 24 to 14 to go get up and get Mark, or, or I'm sorry, 24 to 18 to go get like Marcus Davenport. Right. It cost them a one the next year, okay? If you look at the value chart, if the Saints went from, let's just say, 14 to 21 or 14 to 24 or 14 to 22, instead of a one next year, they could get a second and third or a second and an early fourth this year. And that's what I keep saying is load up. This is a deep draft. Jeff Ireland told us at the Senior Bowl that he thinks this is an amazingly deep draft. You just talked about eight or nine tackles in the first 40 picks. You know, there's a ton of great receivers in this draft. That this is a very early in this draft. There are going to be second round draft picks, third round draft picks that blow up. And, and people are going to be like, man, oh, man, how did they fall out of the first round? So if there's a year to trade yep. back and pick up picks in the top 50 or 60, I would say do it because you've got to need that offensive line, wide receiver, um, depth that running back. I, I mean, look, it, depending on what they do in the secondary, if they trade Marshawn Lattimore, they got a whole that corner. They have a whole that safety right now for cutting Marcus May. So, again, there are a lot of – holes on this team that they could replenish by hitting in the draft and hitting means getting more high value picks like in that top 70 to 90 range jim Derry here with fletcher mackle here on this good friday morning on the datitude podcast if you want to comment uh we're about to move on uh, to a different topic but if you want to comment even if you want to come out and comment about the saints or ask a question about the saints feel free to do so in the comment stream we will show it I can always flip back and forth. That's the good thing about a podcast, especially when it's your own show. You can do whatever the hell you want. That's what we're doing here this Friday morning. All right, last thing on the Saints, um, again, and you talk about the draft and moving back. I mean, there's going to inevitably be a team sitting around 22-24 that says, oh, my goodness, because this team is loaded with skill players. There's going to be a team that says, oh, my goodness, there's only one wide receiver we really want that's still on the board. Let's move up and get him. That's going to happen. And so there's your chance. Uh, Mickey Loomis, have your phone ready. What other positions? We talked about it. Uh, I do think the Saints do need some more depth on defensive line, but 
I'm starting to think that if you're going to look at defense, I think actually the defensive backfield may be a little bit more fragile to me than the defensive line. I think that's actually more of an important need right now uh, for this team. And actually wide receiver depth. I'm glad you bring in Cedric Wilson. I think he's a great number three, but I just don't think you have enough weapons there. So I also think that's something the Saints may look at a little bit later. I think wide receiver in the second and third round, there will actually be plenty of them that, that can come in and start right away. I look, I, I agree with you. I think Cedric Wilson is it's always going to be a competition. I think they're going to go wide receiver earlier in this draft. Uh, you know, a lot is you won for all practical purposes. And Rashid Shaheed is a really good player, but it's kind of a specialty role. So I would say he's your three or four guy is, is like, you know, to stretch the field. Um, I like Cedric Wilson a lot. Maybe he is the number two guy, but you don't just anoint him. That's why I think they are going to try somebody. And you're going to see that player come Fletcher, in. Your, your audio is kind of like fluttering again. I don't know. Yeah. So maybe maybe if you talk closer to it, maybe. Okay, maybe if you go closer to it. Let me see. How's that? That's definitely better, okay, wherever sorry. that is. I don't know what it is. Okay. Oh, that's my, way better. That's way okay, better. Okay, my computer's charged now. I'm so sorry about this. That's Jim. okay. That's, that's okay. We're good. Um, look, I want to move on because I do want to talk about the Pelicans and just talk. But to answer your question, though, I do think wide receivers are need. Like, the team has a ton of needs. Running back depth, because Kamara's coming off his For worst sure. year. Running back depth, uh, like wide receiver depth. Uh, D-line, I agree with you. I think they – I just think they need the – they've invested a lot there. They need those guys to play. They need Peyton Turner to play. They need Brissy to step up and be a massive step in year two. So, uh, again, but I think secondary cornerback safety is a need. There's a ton of needs on this team but it, it, as far as the draft that you can justify – a lot of different positions. I, I couldn't agree more. And look, I also think you talk about defensive line. You know, last year they went out and got two interior defensive linemen in free agency late. Uh, they still are under the cap, about 15, 16 million. So they really could go and shore up there. They, they still can, and they could do it at, at any position, oh. I know. But I think that that's, to, I've always said this. To me, interior defensive linemen and sometimes even extra edge rusher, you can get that in free agency to shore up your depth. That's the best place to me to go to get that. And I'll say this. I think, look, Odell Beckham Jr. is out there. He's going to sign with somebody. It, like, he did a one-year deal with the Ravens this year. Like, Odell, I think, would be a gr good fit here, to be honest with you. On a one-year deal, like, I think Odell could slide in and, and play and be super productive here. So, again, it's just a name that's been floated out there. But I think that that's somebody who could alleviate some of their – issues at wide receiver with Cedric Wilson and, and kind of take the pressure off of, we got to find somebody in the draft. I agree. I mean, so I, I we'll see what they do. Look, draft night's going to be interesting. We have a live show here on NOLA.com. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think uh, we'll see if I have fun or not. Uh, let's move on to the Pelicans. Cause I definitely want to pick your brain on that. I know uh, you talk about the Pelicans more than maybe other, any other sports anchor in, in the metro area and uh so i know you're you're into that well, look to me this team showed a lot of moxie last night there were moments when against the bucks uh when they could have kind of folded their 10 a little bit bucks got within three at one point uh cut that 16 point lead all the way down to three that for a period of time Fletch, they couldn't stop Giannis with a, a bulldozer i mean he was going through him like swiss cheese doing whatever he wanted to do now i get it he's Giannis. it is what it is but I don't know what it is. A light turned on. Um, I thought Jonas was outstanding last night, and they needed him to be. Uh, CJ has really stepped up and kind of taken up some of the slack from BI. And Zion, we see the development. We're starting to see the Zion that we thought and hoped we would see. I ho hope he can make some more free throws. Um, but the Pelicans, to me, are not quite that upper echelon team, but they're showing flashes that they can be. Look at these standings and how close they are down there. I don't think people realize how important it is to be in the top six, and they are just teetering right now. With this really tough homestand, can they stay in that top six? Yeah, they can, and they could also fall to the play-in. But when, this is the thing about the Pelicans. You see who's at one. They're awesome. Denver Nuggets, defending champs. Jokic, two-time MVP. I mean, Mike Malone's a great coach. The synergy they play with, they are it. Like, Look, for all practical purposes, we're probably looking at a Boston-Denver finals, okay? I certainly think Boston is coming out of the East. 
Boston is 11 games up on the Bucs. Yeah. Boston is the new juggernaut. They've played in three of the last four Eastern Conference Finals. They've been to the finals. Jason Tatum's only 25. Boston is awesome. Boston is the Warriors from 10 years ago, okay? But the West right now, look at this. I can make an argument. Take Denver off the board because Denver's the best, okay? Right. Clearly the best. Even if they're only a half a game up, they're the best. Minnesota, are, are they great? I don't know. Oklahoma City's so young. They play great. Are they great? I don't know. The Clippers have been the biggest letdown in the NBA the last few years. Are they great? I don't know. They're floundering right now. The Pelicans have a world of talent, and they're finally putting it together. Dallas, Luka, is like maybe the best player in the league right now, and, and Kyrie's playing well, but they were so bad last year, they quit and missed the playing. You know? So just looking at that top six, like, I, I can make an argument that the Pelicans could beat any of these team, teams in a series. Like, if they get a 4-5 with the Clippers, yeah, I could see them beating them. I could see them getting to the second round. I could see this team making a run to the Western Conference Final. I could also see them going out in round one if they get a 4-5 matchup with Luka, and he's playing like he does right now, and he drops 40 in four of the six games they end up playing. You know, Oklahoma City is so well coached and in the way they play within their system, even though the Pelicans could maul them size-wise, they run circles around them every time they play them. Like Minnesota, the Pelicans play really well against, but like that team's crazy talented. And if Towns comes back, like, so I, that's one great thing about the Western Conference right now is it's kind of like the NFL. You talked about all these teams are in it until the bitter end. Right now, this is, I mean, look, the Lakers and the Warriors are 9 and 10. They're going to have to come through the play-in. But the Lakers are getting hot right now. And they came through the play-in last year and made it to the Western Conference And the Warriors Finals. are in danger of not holding on to that 10th spot because the Rockets are right on their heels. Right. So, but again, that's what's great about the Western Conference right now. I, I do think the Pelicans are going to stay clear of the play-in. And I think that that is significant. I think they're going to finish 4, Great. 5, or 6. And, and, and that is huge because they'll get a week to breathe and, and kind of reset getting ready for the playoffs while the other teams come through the play-in um, down, the, down the, the road, so to say. Um, but last night's win was crucial. Boston on Saturday is, is going to be hard as can be. Phoenix on Monday. I mean, the schedule doesn't. Orlando's a team on the up. Look, San Antonio's terrible, but then they're at Phoenix hard. At Portland should be a win. Sacramento is going to be playing to try to stay in the play in and stay high in the play in. And then you got at Golden State, just like you said. And then you close the. I mean, these games down the stretch, uh, I mean, besides San Antonio and Portland, all the rest have massive implications for both teams in, in that schedule. So. It's going to be interesting to see what they do down the stretch. I think bare minimum, you got to go five and four over this uh, this stretch to avoid the play on play in maybe six and three. And you look at this, this, you know, we can finally fit the remaining schedule all on one screen here. First time that we've been able to do that this year. But you know, David Grubb, uh, who has been on the show many a times, was was talking uh, on social media about asking the question: Is this the most important home stand in franchise history? And Fletch, I think you can make a case that it is. Yeah, I agree. Like losing the game against Oklahoma City was a crusher oh, man, because really you came was. all the way back. You're up five with three minutes to play. You're control when CJ look Trey hit that shot. CJ hit that crazy shot, and they're up five. And I thought we we're seeing something here. This is a team that the, the, they just flipped into. Okay, and then. OKC just took over and closes on a 12-0 run. Backbreaker. And then I thought, oh, man, oh, man. The, the, the Bucks are coming in. Like, Giannis, like, destroys his team in the paint. If Dame gets hot, thankfully he didn't. But if Dame gets hot, like, this could be lights out. And then the only way to me they're going to beat Boston is maybe if Boston is resting guys or, like, Boston's already secured the one seed. So maybe the intensity isn't what it needs to be, even if they play their guys because they've already secured the one seed. So it doesn't matter. But you're right. I mean, look, Phoenix is is a play-in team that's been one of the biggest disappointments in the NBA. They're going to be gunning for one of those, a, a, a late rush to get in to the playoffs and clear the play-in. And, and then, yeah, and then you got to go to Phoenix. And then 
you know, the Clippers are playing for something. Golden State's playing for something. Sacramento's playing for something. I, I mean, it's just, yeah. But the homestand you're talking about, you got to close with Boston, Phoenix, Orlando, San Antonio. You need, you know, I would say in these four games left on this homestand, you need to go three and one. I you know? agree with you. Uh, yeah. It's a good thing the Suns fired Monty, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that really Yeah, I mean. Talk about a letdown. You got Matt Ishbia comes in, the owner, spending money, trading for guys, don't care about picks, firing the coach, yeah, that like building this like fantasy team, and yet they're in the play-in right now. Yeah. It, it's insane to look at that team with that talent. And they're the biggest disappointment in basketball. I mean, like they were supposed to be they were supposed to be this force in the West and and yeah. again, I don't know where I don't know what's going to happen down the stretch in the playoffs. But to this point, ninety percent of the way through the regular season, there's no bigger disappointment than Phoenix. I couldn't agree more. And look, I will say this about the Pels before we move on: uh, the reason why I think last night's win is in the top three or four wins of the year, because the way when you lose a game like they lost earlier in the week against Oklahoma city, you make all your way back. You use, you expend all this emotional energy to come back and take that lead. And it looks like you're going to pull it off Man, losing is heartbreaking. And the way that this team throughout the season really has come back and bounced back after emotional letdowns, like big time emotional letdowns. They seem to bounce back big. Like when BI got hurt, you, People were on social media saying, got to go bet the heat. It's the bet of the year. The Pelicans are six point. I'm like, this is the bet of the year to me on the Pelicans because they have been bouncing back. And if you haven't watched this team, you don't realize that that's who they are. They are a resilient group, which is why I think they are a scary team in the playoffs because they are able to put a heartbreaker in their rear view mirror. And I think Willie Green, the how much he's matured in just a couple of years is incredible. And I wouldn't want to play the Pelicans in the playoffs. No, and look, that's what a lot of the national pundits are saying. You hear the J.J. Reddicks and the Kendrick Perkinses and a lot of these. I watch a lot of these national shows, and these are former players that know the game. Some of them played for this organization. Right. And and they say that, that like even like Shaq and, and, and Barkley, when they're on TV, and look, they were, they were hammering Zion hard earlier in the year, but nobody wants to play the team. That's, that's why I could talk myself into them making it to the Western Conference Finals. Absolutely. Absolutely, positively, no doubt. And then again, I could say, hey, the the, the been there, done that, it, it caught up with them, and they went out in the first round. But there is no doubt. They are deep. They are talented. Look, I, I've loved covering. I always joke that, you know, people find God in their lives. I found the NBA. I've loved covering the NBA. I started working at WDSU in 2002, right when the NBA relocated back here after the Jazz left in 79. So I've, I've, I've invested in it. I love covering it and talking about it. This is the deepest team they've had. I agree. The, the 07, 08 team, when that was, that was the best, the best team. 56 wins. Byron Scott was the NBA coach of the year. Chris Paul was the runner-up MVP. But Byron Scott played his starters, and their bench was nothing. It was like Gennaro Pargo and Bonzi Wells and no one else, okay? And then – so good, good, great team, probably, you know, like a fantastic starting five. But the 2018 team was good with Drew and with Miritich and with Anthony Davis and, and, and with Rondo playing point guard. But again, no depth. I mean, no depth whatsoever. Rondo was on his last leg. And, and you could argue that like each one more was a starter. And that was crazy. This is the deepest team they've ever had capable of sustaining runs, figuring out other teams in a series because they've got suitors, defenders. They can go small. They can go big. It's the deepest team they have since they've got here 20 years ago. You still send George Shen Christmas cards, don't you? <laughs> I don't, but I did see him last year. <laughs> did you? He was in town, and he was auctioning off a car, and he looked – he's like in his 80s now. Yeah. He looked great. He was great. We had a great conversation. He was great. So, For yeah. those who don't know, by the way, George Chen is the was the owner of the Charlotte Hornets who brought the Hornets. He and what's the other guy's Ray name? Woolridge. Ray, Ray Woolridge. Ray Woolridge was the other guy's name. They brought the Hornets to New Orleans back uh, 20-plus years ago, 
and they're the reason why, uh, well, one of the main reasons why the NBA is back in New Orleans after a 25-year layoff, more than that, more than 25-year layoff when the Jazz left in the 70s. Uh, lastly, last thing I'll say on the Pels, I promise, uh, I've been screaming it. You look at those numbers on the left of your screen, plus 2,500 to win the conference championship, plus 7,000 to win the NBA champ. Do I think they're going to win either one of those? Probably not. But there is no better value in the betting world in the NBA than the New Orleans Pelicans. That's all I'm, that's all I'm screaming. All right, lastly, real, real quickly, LSU wins basketball. Got to talk about them. Got their 30th win. Uh, Kim, Mul- Kim Mulkey is, is uh, doing what Kim Mulkey does and firing up her troops, and it's us against the world. They looked uh, underwhelming for the first, uh, let's say, six quarters of their NCAA tournament lives this year and actually six and a half quarters but they turned they ratcheted it up against middle tennessee in the middle of the third quarter uh last week now they get a ucla team that has one less day off they have to go to albany from los angeles i don't know if that's going to make a difference or not but can this team get it together and make you feel like they can win a championship again um no yeah, but, I agree. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. But last year, I didn't know if they were going to get past Miami in the Cavender Twins, and they did. Then in the Final Four, I didn't think they were going to get past Virginia Tech and Georgia Amore, and uh, I can't think of the, the the big they have there for yeah. Virginia Tech. Her name slips my mind right now. And then when they got to Iowa, I thought, well, you know, Caitlin, Caitlin Clark. Clark. It's probably where the road ends. It's been a great year, like. And, and, and yet they just kept winning. Even if they won ugly, they just kept winning. And that was like this mulky magic we talked about. So again, like, I, sure. Like, I watched a lot of UCLA. I watched the game on Monday night. I went back and watched some of their games this year. I mean, that Kiki Wright is really, really good. And, and the, 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 the big girl, Lauren Stubbs, I believe is her name, is really, really good. So they could give LSU fits. More size, probably better guard play. Unless Flage goes off, Flage is amazing. Like Flage yep, is, 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 I think their best player. And so, um, so can they beat them? Sure. And then can they beat Iowa? Sure. But again, I, I don't know. The way they play doesn't instill a lot of confidence. But again, it's LSU. It's Mulky Magic. I, I wouldn't put it past them getting to the Final Four. And uh, in 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 us talking about, boy, it wasn't pretty. But they just they just got it done. It's just meant to be. It's supposed to be LSU versus Iowa. All the stuff about Pistol Pete and Caitlin Clark a few weeks ago, it's just meant to be. That's just the yeah. way that I see it. It's got to happen. So, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's what everybody – and I'll say this. The NBA or the NCAA people that put this bracket together, yeah. like what the hell were you thinking? Like these uh, No four, clue. These four teams – No clue. These, these are four final four teams. Colorado beat LSU to open the season and is a really great team. LSU's the defending champ. Kaitlyn Clark is the greatest player maybe in the history of the sport. And UCLA is a team on the rise with a star in Kiki. Ridiculous. Right. right. And it's like those four teams, if this was the final four, I'd be, man, oh, man. You got star power, defending champs, teams on the rise, East Coast, Deep South, you know, like Midwest. And yet they put them together and they won't even get out of that regional, one of them is coming out of it. So I just think, I, I, I get it. They can't predict all these things, but man, oh man, like just horrible planning by the NCAA and whoever put these brackets together. I just want to say that the NCAA is a mess and it's not just football. It's not just men's basketball. It's a mess. I'm just going to say that. I'm going to leave it with that. Fletch, uh, again, uh, thank you for drinking the all the water in the fountain of youth and not leaving any for the rest of us. And uh, we'll keep watching you on WDSU. Sorry about my, uh, my audio issues. Oh, good. My here. friend. I apologize. So back where I started in the same spot, and, you know, should have just stayed. <laughs> well, you had to plug in. We didn't want to lose you halfway through the show. That's that would have been, yeah. that would have been way worse. I can't wait to have you on again. Uh, looking, looking forward to, to seeing what's going on. We're going to have you when the Pelicans make the playoffs. We'll have you back on. All right. Cool deal. Thank you, my friend. Fletcher Mackle here on this good Friday morning. What are you going to do for uh, Easter? Having the family over. See, I, I thought we were supposed to go to uh, to a, another family member's house. 
That's what I was told all along, and then it sprung on me yesterday. No, they're coming over here. What? Oh, boy. Not like cleaning up. Anyway, did I say that out loud? I'm not supposed to say that out loud. They listen sometimes, so. I love you. Love you all. Time to move on to the extra point for today. 42 years ago today, the GOAT. No, the real GOAT. Not the one that's still playing and is about to go into a wheelchair. When's he going to retire anyway? I'm talking about there, there is only one GOAT, and that is Michael Jordan. 42 years ago today, I was a 13-year-old kid at the top of the terrace in the what was called then the Louisiana Superdome to watch maybe one of the greatest national championship games ever played. But more importantly, the North Carolina winning the national championship was the fact that Michael Jordan became, well, Michael Jordan. We all know what happened after that, but this was the shot that kind of led things off for him and kicked him into overdrive and made him turned him into the GOAT again. We go back to March 29th, 1982, and how North Carolina won the national championship. By the way, notice some differences of the court back uh, 42 years ago. It doesn't look any, nothing looks the same. I don't look the same. None of us look the same. Everything was different. Maybe a little bit better, too. What it does, Gary, it changes the offensive philosophy completely for North Carolina. They, with the lead, could force Georgetown to be man-to-man. -man. Now Georgetown back in the zone. Most coaches, though, with a timeout, go ahead and change their defense just to throw the other team off stride. Let's see if Georgetown now comes out man-to-man. -man. Georgetown still has one timeout left. North Carolina has four, 32 seconds to go. A one-point lead for Georgetown. No, they stay in the 1-3-1 with Ewing in the middle. They've got to look to get it in there. You can't with a shot blocker like Ewing take so much time. Gordy to Black. The time, 18. Shot, Jordan. Michael Jordan. 14 seconds. Brown. Look for, look for Sleepy Floyd. Look. Oh, he threw it to the wrong man. He threw it to Worthy. It's over. It's over. He's fouled by Eric Smith. Fred Brown, somehow or another, threw the ball into the hands of James Worthy. Look at Dean Smith. Totally in control. Everybody going crazy. See if he doesn't call a timeout to settle things down. where they could have used the timeout. And Georgetown loses it. North Carolina has won the 1982 NCAA championship. So many cool things about that clip. Um, not just Jordan. And I look, he's the GOAT. He is the GOAT. I don't care what you think. I'm not debating here. You can talk about whoever you want. I mean, I saw Charles Barkley's uh, top 10 all-time players the other day, and he's old like me. He had La, La Flop at, like, number five. Uh, now I wouldn't go that far. I think LeBron is certainly in the, the top five of all time. But anyway, I think Michael Jordan's number one. But, you know, some interesting things in, the, on the, in that clip, uh, the late great Dean Smith in there, John Thompson. Remember when Georgetown was actually Georgetown? Like, they were – you didn't want to play them. You knew they were going to be really good. James Worthy, uh, my dad, uh, the company that he used to work for way back when, uh, James Worthy was one of the, uh, was their main spokesperson for a while, and my dad got to know James Worthy a little bit. Really fantastic guy. Uh, just just a cool clip. Looking at the how many of you old like me remember the old orange lights in the Superdome on the scoreboard? Man, how times are. you see it in the. You can't see that they're orange, but that old scoreboard in the back behind Michael Jordan. A different time for sure. Again, some people say it was better. I don't know. Could we go without our phones and stuff like that today? Maybe I'd like to try for a few weeks. But then we wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to see me. So there you go. Yeah, there's a back and forth there. All right, that is going to wrap it up for this Good Friday. I want to thank today's guest, Fletcher Mackle, and thank Gabe Henderson for his work behind the scenes, cutting out clips, doing all the things that people don't want to do. You, you see him every day on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, and you can search for me on Facebook to see more on Reels. That's what they call it. Reminder, 
programming note, there is no show on Monday. Um, I'm going to take a long weekend and spend some time with my kids. I'm going to reintroduce myself, although they were back there yelling. I'm glad you didn't hear anything. Oh, boy. I hate when school's out, even though I love my kids to death, but when school's out, you know what I mean? We hope you can join us next on Wednesday for more talk on whatever we deem worthy, hopefully an LSU run to the women's final four, a few Pelicans victories, as well as the fantasy roundup with Spencer, the guru. We'll be talking about all kinds of things on Wednesday. A reminder to subscribe to our Datitude YouTube page and click the little bell to receive notifications. When we go in the air live, you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast and find a replay of the show on NOLA.com slash sports. You can write to me if you want to talk. I always respond, unless you're just a real jerk, but I'm probably going to respond to even if you're a jerk. You can find me, you can email me at jderry at theadvocate.com. We will see you next Wednesday. Have a great weekend. Have a happy, happy Easter. Take it easy, my friends. If you're looking for the latest scoop and in-depth interviews on the Saints, the NFL, the Pelicans, LSU, along with the best bets of the week, then lucky you. Along with high-powered, in-the-know guests who cover our teams, Jim Derry brings plenty of datitude. And he'll always tell you the way it is, or at least the way he thinks it is.